Today, my guest is Jeff Cutbert, who is the Police Crime Commissioner. Hi. Hi there. So, for those who don't know, what is a, a PCC? Well, it stands for Police and Crime Commissioner. Uh, it was created by the Conservative and Liberal government, uh, Lib Dem government, uh, back in 2010. And they first came into uh, place in um, 2011. Right. Uh, and it's, it takes the place of the old police authority, which some people might remember. And the police authority, which was mainly local councillors, in this case from Gwent, uh, had the job of holding the chief constable to account. So now that uh, that government then in, in 2010 and 2011 uh, decided to invest those powers in one elected official um, on the grounds that there'd be greater accountability. And the position is, is still here. So for those who don't know, how does the voting process work? How do you apply to be PCC? Well, you, you don't... It depends. I came through a party route. Uh, it should be well known that I was a Labour Party candidate. doesn't have to be. Independence uh, stand as well. Uh, but all you need to do legally is to complete the nomination papers. You, it's a little more onerous than standing for Parliament, the Assembly or Local Council in that you have to get 100 signatories in support. Uh, once you've got that on your nomination paper, then you can uh, apply to be a candidate. Is uh, that 100 signatures from MPs and, and no, politicians? No, 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 from citizens of uh, Gwent in oh, this okay. case. Um, and once you've got that, you can, you're then in the ballot. And then it's up to you to campaign and to win the most votes. For comparison, um, I, I can't remember how many it is, and isn't it only like 15 or 10 signatures you need to run as councillor? Mm. So obviously that's a lot of people. I mean, that's not restricted to area, is it? Though That's in the whole of Gwent. So. Yeah, uh, yes, in, in terms of PCC, because, because the, the, the authorities for the whole of Gwent, uh, yeah, it's con it was considered that you needed a greater level of declared support before you were allowed to be a candidate, and incidentally, the deposit... Whereas it's five hundred pounds for Parliament, it's five thousand uh, pounds to stand for PCC. All oh, right. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you were um, a politician before. Why the career change? Well, I was the Assembly member for Caerphilly for thirteen years, uh, and a member of the Welsh Government for three and a half years in my final term. Um, and uh, I, I, f I felt I was ready to do something different. You know, I'd, I I loved being a backbencher, and I really, really loved being a uh, member of the Welsh Government. It was an enormous privilege. Um, however, Carwyn Jones, who the First Minister, uh, decided that he wanted a fresh team for the next elections. I'd been thinking of standing down in order to look at what I could do differently. Uh, and then I thought, yeah, it is the right time to look for something else. It wasn't an immediate decision, uh, 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 but a year gap before me announcing I was going to stand down from the Assembly and then I was going to stand for Police and Crime Commissioner. But I'm very glad I made that choice because uh, I think I've still got something to, to offer uh, and I'm looking forward to completing my term. Sounds good. Um, how do you feel Gwent Police are doing at the moment? What's going well and what's not going so well? Right, well, look... I, I, first of all, in terms of the, the formal response to that uh, question, uh, the Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary, they, they carry out uh, regular um, assessments of police performance. Um, about three years ago, when the Chief Constable, Jeff Farrar, who's recently retired, when he took over, uh, Gwent police were judged officially as requiring improvement. They're now judged overall as good. Right, okay. Uh, so clearly there's been a significant improvement in the performance and stewardship of the Gwent Police. And I can endorse that, um, uh, even though we've had uh, considerable cuts or, or since uh, 2010, actually. Um, nevertheless, the, the Gwent Force has sought to use its resources as well as possible, and by listening to the public. There are always room, always room for improvement. Uh, we're not going to stand still. But on the whole, I'm uh, reasonably satisfied with where we're at. What are the areas you think need improving at the moment? Well, some of the things are not directly within control of the Gwent Police. Okay. The biggest single issue, as for all public service, is money. Is how much financial resources we have. Now, our main provider, roughly 70% of our whole budget comes from central government, from the Chancellor the Home, and the Home Secretary. That has been reducing since 2010. Uh, by roughly 2% per year. Uh, 
which may not sound a large amount in percentage terms, but it's meant since that time we've lost about £40 million out of our budget. Wow. And, uh, I mean, our total budget per annum is about 130, so that's had an impact. We've lost over 300 police officers as a result of that. So we've had to be very creative and imaginative in how we allocate existing resources. We're managing to recruit more officers now through efficiency savings, not through more money. Uh, and I, I would say that you know the biggest single issue we still have to address is that of personnel, is having more bobbies on the beat and PCSOs uh, on neighbourhood policing teams. That's my biggest single drive. Okay. Um, do you have any personal goals or things you'd like to achieve uh, while you're PCC? Yeah, certainly. What, what I would like to be able to do uh, in three years' time um, is to be able to say all the evidence points to the fact that crime has reduced significantly and that people feel safer in their communities. And that's actually not the same thing, uh, remarkably. People right. come, it's the fear of crime is often worse than crime itself oh, right. uh, in terms of the psychology of people, and we have to look at that very carefully. But if I, through a variety of measures, can feel confident that the fear of crime has been significantly reduced, then I will regard it as a success. In the two times we've met, uh, we've spoken about ideology, hate crimes and terrorism. Do you believe these are prevalent issues in Newport? They're certainly present. I wouldn't say that they're, you know, top of the agenda in terms of what average citizens uh, are worried about. But for those that are affected by hate crime uh, and fear of terrorism, uh, then they are very important. Um, there was a, a spike in hate crime after Brexit. There's no doubt about that. The statistics are, are clear. It was about a threefold increase. Not huge actual numbers, but in terms of percentage rise, it was a significant 300% increase. Uh, we go out of our way to make it absolutely clear that no one should feel threatened or frightened because of who they are and what they are. Whether it's issues to do with race, religion, sexuality, disability, age, whatever it might be, people have the right to live uh, secure lives. So what has improved significantly is the reporting of it. In the past, people felt a bit intimidated, frightened. Would, would they have repercussions, for example? That has been overcome to a large extent, which partially explains the rise in reporting. Uh, but um, it's there. Uh, I, I don't think people ought to feel um, alarmed. They should be alert to it. Uh, but I don't want people to go about worrying that they might, they might be assaulted, they might be verbally abused. But if that does happen... They must report it. Uh, w one of the questions I have, which was brought up actually by Adam Smith, because he basically was asking, um, when are you going to release the uh, numbers of hate crimes that actually happened in Newport? And I think that is kind of something, a significant number to actually look at, because can, when you compare that to, I suppose, an, uh, I suppose national average, if we were going to go by per capita, perhaps, um, it'd be interesting to look at those statistics, considering we are quite multicultural in Newport. Yeah, um, I mean, figures figures are released, um, and certainly if someone wants them specifically, I can probably provide those. They're not large numbers, um, uh, which I'm pleased to say. But it was the it was the spike, the increase uh, that occurred that we, we we noticed, and likewise after some of the terrible atrocities in Manchester and London over the last couple of months, uh, there was a spike, but not huge numbers. Uh, I mean, we, we're probably talking for the most uh, in single figures, uh, so that it's not it's not huge. But where it does happen, uh, then it's got to be dealt with. Um, what, what about the ratio of reports to actual hate crimes? I mean, is there a significant difference between people reporting it and then the police actually saying, "Well, this is a hate crime"? Oh, well, it's 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 the perception of the victim that's important. Mm. If the victim believes that they've been targeted because they're different, then we would regard it as a, as a, as a hate crime. Now, okay. so it does depend on the circumstances, um, uh, and we need to look in each case on its own merits. Okay. When Al interviewed you in the past uh, in Rainbow Newport conference, uh, you spoke to him about hate crimes and Brexit. You said Brexit gave people some sense of license to go out and commit hate crimes. Um, do you think this has calmed since then? 
and is this an issue in, in that you've seen in your port? Well, yeah. Look, as, I, I've, as I've just said, there was also a spike with the, the recent atrocities in, in, in Manchester and uh, and London. But um, there's no doubt that some people who held particularly far right views uh, thought they had an opportunity to actually exercise uh, those those views. I don't think that there's been any move. Uh, of any significance towards right-wing ideology amongst the people of Newport or, or Gwent more, more generally. It's those that held those prejudices to start with have felt um, a little bit more able, shall we say, to express those views. But I, I think things are calming down in, in terms of your main question. Um, but you know, we, we remain vigilant uh, and we know we're in sensitive times. On the topic of ideology, how effective would you say programmes such as PREVENT have been at preventing radical behaviour. Also, how engaged has that been with young people? Yeah, this is a very much eye of the beholder uh, question. For those who don't know, because um, I've not heard of this programme, what is PREVENT? Well, PREVENT is uh, one of the um, uh, counter-extremism programmes that exists right across the UK. It's uh, handled in, in Wales a little differently from, from uh, in England. Uh, and it's really about identifying where radicalization could take place and putting in measures to prevent it escalating uh, in the way that it could uh, otherwise. Uh, there's also uh, parts of the program called uh, Protect, when uh, self-explanatory, where we have evidence that something's going to happen, we, we put things in. Right. But it, it's very much about engaging with communities, particularly the Islamic community. Often I feel it's, it's just about them. It isn't. But um, certainly at, at the moment, there is il Islamophobia out there. We, we, we know that, and that is the single community that feels most threatened. Uh, and it's very much about working with religious leaders, with community leaders, with schools and colleges to identify where radicalization might be taking place if a person uh, is in danger of being radicalized by his or her actions and may betray certain things, is then working with them to point to a more positive future. Uh, and it's having some effect. It, is, it has been criticized very much in England uh, as being focused um, against the Islamic community and there's some justification for that in England, not, not a huge amount because it's a difficult subject. In Wales we have tended to treat it differently. We work with the, the Welsh Government on community cohesion uh, and community safety uh, and we try to embed the police officers that represent our side of pre prevent um, uh, within the community. So they will work with community groups, with, with religious leaders, with other community leaders uh, and with local schools so that people are known uh, and there's less of a threat. Uh, so it, it is an important uh, method of helping to reduce radicalization and some of the terrible consequences that that can lead to. Would you like to carry that program on and programs like that um, after you leave as PCC? After I leave as PCC? If you do, in the next two. <laughs> well, I'm, the, the reason I, uh, I, I exclaimed that point is that's still three years away if I, if I was to decide not to stand again. Right. But, uh, you know, I'm nowhere near taking any decisions on that at this point. Uh, I mean, things are constantly changing look uh, as the world around us changes so these programs are, are under regular review about how effective they are if there needs to be changes uh, or a completely different type of program and we need to look at the evidence but certainly as it stands at the moment within Gwent uh, I'm reasonably content that we're working as well as we can with key partners also involves local authorities the health board anyone that comes into people into contact with people uh, so, as I said, we keep it under review. Whether it will still be in its current form in three years' time, I can't say. Okay. Um, as PCC, do you find your budget has constraints on what you can and can't fund? For example, do you feel your mandatory funding restricts your ability to fund projects you might have in mind? You, you mentioned the cuts earlier, obviously. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, we all live in the real world, and, and uh, money is fundamental to what we want to do. And there have been significant cuts to the Gwent police budget, as there has to all police service budgets across England and Wales. Let me make that clear. We're not exceptional in that sense. Uh, and, but as I've said, we, we've, we've actually lost 27% of our budget from 210 to, to where we are now. 
uh, and that's had a severe impact, particularly on police personnel, both officers and civilian staff. We're trying to reverse that now, but certainly in terms of our ability to employ more officers, we need better budget settlement. It's very simple. Um, also, there are huge um, skill set issues uh, which we need to address. Uh, for example, more than 50% of all crime now in England and Wales is cyber-based. Now, that holds enormous implications for police training and the skill sets that they have to have. So we have to make sure they've got up-to-date equipment, uh, that we use modern IT systems for communication so the police can be out and about there more often. They don't have to keep going back to police stations to fill in reports. Uh, so certainly funding has had some issues and some constraints. Now, I am fortunate in that I am able to raise money locally through what's called the precept, which is collected uh, with the council tax. Uh, it is my job to determine what that precept should be. Uh, it's been increased regularly over the last few years by about 4%, uh, and that's enabled us to keep, with 2% cuts from central government, to keep a, a flat line, because 70% of our money at the moment comes from central government, 30% raised locally, so you can work out the maths. Right. Uh, so through that, we've been able to flat line. doesn't take any account of inflation, uh, and if inflation was to start rising significantly, then I'd have to look very carefully at the precept rises for future financial years. Uh, unless, of course, there is a change of heart by the UK government uh, in terms of the funding of emergency services. That could happen. It could happen. I understand Theresa May's poo-pooed the idea a bit today in Parliament, but we'll see. There's certainly a lot of public support for emergency services now. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I've, I've read recently as well that uh, quite a few of the backbenchers aren't really in support of uh, austerity either. That's something that's started to have a bit of revolt in the Conservative Party itself. Hmm. So it might be interesting to see. Though one of the things about, um, obviously with the budget that you do have, um, and what limited spending you do have on, I suppose, creative ideas to actually combat um, crime and what's happening... Um, what would you say, because obviously when, when you're deciding a candidate then, um, how were you significantly different from the other candidates if you're all faced with the same problems and there's not really much, uh, I suppose, arm space to do much else? Well, if you're referring to a year ago, which is when I was elected, mm. um, clearly the, from my party's point of view, the policies of austerity were something that we opposed. Um, austerity is a choice. It, it is not a scientific necessity. It's a choice that the UK government took. Uh, and uh, we are not happy with austerity. We're, we certainly you know, want to see um, uh, reductions where that was appropriate uh, in, in terms of services. Uh, and, and we certainly want cost-effective spending. But I suppose the, what made the difference to me, and indeed I, I had opposition from the Conservative Party and Plaid Cymru, uh, was I think we had the better approach to what we wanted to do with the police as a key public service. Uh, and I very much believe in, in the ethos in Wales of one public service with a number of spokes and the police working with local government, the health board, etc., and others to deliver well-being for, for the citizens of, of Gwent. And I think that was, that was a marked difference between myself and the other candidates. Now, in terms of what the economic and the financial situation would be in three years' time, at this moment, it's anyone's guess. Uh, and, you know, no, no serious political party or individual come to that should try and decide now what their policy is going to be in three years' time because mm. there's so many variables. What can you do which the Chief Constable cannot. Um, is there any level of hierarchy between the two of you, or is it level in the ability to do certain things? Right, it's a very good question, and understandably many members of the public think that I can control directly operational policing. In other words, the day-to-day -day deployment of police officers and the numbers that, that we have. That isn't my role. That is the role of the Chief Constable. Uh, and indeed, and that's right, because it's a police professional job. Uh, when I was sworn into office, I had to sign an oath, so it was a legal document, that I would not, and this was the word, interfere in operational policing. Okay? My job, 
however, is to hold the Chief Constable to account for the delivery of the priorities within my police and crime plan. Right. Uh, and I, 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 uh, I determine my priorities based on the surveys that I have of people in Gwent. And they tell me things, for example, about the importance of neighbourhood policing, of community, uh, community cohesion, of crime reduction. So those will feature very heavily in my plan, which has now been published. By the way, it's, um, it's available from my office in hard copy and it's available online. People just want to go onto PCC for Gwent. They can download a copy of the plan to see the priorities. Okay. Uh, and it is the Chief Constable's job to deliver against those priorities and I will hold him or her accountable to it. Formally, I have the duty and the uh, right to hire and fire the Chief Constable. So in a sense, you could say that's a hierarchy, but that's something you'd only exercise in the most dire of circumstances. Uh, really, we try and work together, uh, and that has many, uh, many advantages. I'm technically the public face of policing. I'm the one that's held to account by the public for the delivery of the plan. And there is a committee that's set up called the Police and Crime Panel, which scrutinizes me roughly every quarter uh, about how things, how things are going. So hopefully that describes the different duties and functions of the Chief Constable and myself. And people may, may, may or may not be aware that Jeff Farrar, who was the Chief Constable for getting on for the last four years, has just retired. Uh, the acting Chief Constable is um, Julian Williams, who is the current Deputy Chief Constable. Uh, and hopefully I'll be able to make an announcement uh, by the beginning of August on the permanent appointment for the Chief Constable. Right, OK. Um, going more local now into Newport, um, shop owners and employees in Newport have recently said that antisocial behaviour is losing them business, is, is costing them sales, etc., and customers. Um, do you agree with this? And if so, what's your plan to tackle that? Right, well, obviously, I, I can't dispute that that's what they've said. And if they feel that that's the case, I'm naturally concerned and would want to work with them as individuals or through their associations to uh, try to see what we can do to improve matters. Uh, Antisocial behaviour itself and sometimes this is perception rather than fact, is actually decreasing. Um, during this, over the last financial year, it decreased by 14%, including Newport, over the whole of, of Gwent. So the actual number of reported cases is, is falling, uh, and we're anticipating further reductions, a lot of which is down to partnership activity um, and community safety work uh, and creating better facilities because it tends to be younger people who engage in this sort of activity, but creating a more positive um, activities for younger people to get engaged in. But that doesn't always work. And antisocial behaviour, to a degree, has always been with us, and it's something that we'll constantly have to have to address. But on the specific issue of it hitting the trading of, of local retailers. Uh, I'm concerned about that. Certainly, I'm very happy to work jointly with uh, Newport City Council, for example, who also have responsibilities in, in this area. Very willing to meet uh, retailers, and if they're listening to this, whether they'd like to do it through an, uh, their association, uh, whether it's the FSB or the, even the CBI or, or their own trade associations, very happy to meet and hear what the issues are and see what we can do about it. Okie dokie. Um, do you feel that the, the cut and lack of community centres and, and things like that has contributed to antisocial behaviour? Well, there are many factors in antisocial behaviour uh, and certainly local authorities who in the main run community centres are strapped for cash. Okay. Um, that's the same problem that we've got. Um, there is no organisation that overfunded the NHS is probably the most the best funded but even that uh, has to watch the watch the books um, so local authorities really have to revert to their core responsibilities uh, that's education social services um, housing although in Newport of course it's it's been delegated to Newport City Homes uh, but that's what local authorities must focus on to a degree so whilst they're still supporting community centres and libraries and leisure facilities, those are the areas that are going to feel the pinch first. 
Um, some community centres are run by voluntary groups uh, and even some by local community councils, and that's fine. But uh, there's no doubt that where they are forced to close or merge or slim down, that, of course, will mean fewer facilities for local people, particularly younger people, and that's going to have an impact. Mm. Many residents um, these days have said they notice people using, uh, quite openly using, illegal drugs in Newport um, without any attempt to hide it. Um, what do you think of that? Well, you, you know, you probably saw the news uh, yesterday that there's been another significant drugs bust uh, in Newport. Work to identify people dealing in Class A drugs. Um, a lot have been arrested, uh, taken into custody, go through the court process. This uh, follows on from Operation Jewels uh, in the earlier part of this year, January, and then an another one about uh, six weeks ago, which took off the streets a serious number of people who are involved in the supply of uh, Class A drugs. So whilst I understand people's frustration where they will see that happening, as long as we get the intelligence and local people are providing more and more intelligence now about where they see it, um, then we will take them out. Uh, and that's uh, uh, Superintendent Glyn Fernquest is quoted in the press as saying just that today. Uh, and I've issued statements in support of what's being done. So, uh, look, let me reassure people, uh, where we get good intelligence, we'll act, uh, and we'll act with firmness. It's great that you're, you're, you're busting all those sort of high-class drugs, um, but what about the, the main one that people see, cannabis, on the streets? Well, yeah, look, all these, all these dealings, uh, all, all these tradings are, are, are illegal, they're, they're antisocial, uh, our focus at the moment is on the drugs that do the most harm. Um, and before I get into arguments about whether it's those or alcohol, yes, they all do harm. But these drugs are illegal, and the supply of them is illegal. Uh, and we need to crack down because in central Newport, it's a bit of a hot spot, to put it mildly. Uh, but look, we're, we're not tolerant of uh, the misuse of, of drugs because they damage people, whatever they, they may be. And again, it's a question of intelligence. And if people are openly trading cannabis on the streets, then, uh, you know, pass on that intelligence and we will do our very best to act. So it is down to residents to keep reporting what it is. Uh, the residents are our best source of intelligence. Um, you know, certainly there are formal avenues where we'll get things reported through the courts or other key public sector partners like community safety wardens and local authorities like uh, health uh, professionals, but it is that the public are there all the time and they can pass on information anonymously. Uh, they don't have to get themselves into trouble. Uh, obviously, we, we don't want people to put themselves in danger, so do it at the right time. Uh, but yet, local intelligence is critical. Um, do you feel the political and police representatives of Newport spend more money covering up the problems in Newport than fixing them? Well, look, you'll, I'm afraid you'll have to explain that question. I'm so not sort really of, clear what you mean. Sort of making things look pretty, sort of uh, friars. Oh, I see, um, uh, sort um, of cosmetic uh, issues. Yeah, uh, rather covering than up with sugar, yeah, you know. <laughs> Masking yeah. was actually there. Yeah. Um, well, that is a matter for the local authority. Uh, but look, it, it's about quality of life as well. Um, we, there's stacks of evidence to show that if people like their surroundings, if they see um, good quality works of art, if they see trouble taken to improve the appearance of their area, particularly city centres, uh, they tend to respect that. I know there's a cost, of course there is, uh, and there will always be issues of, well, look, if you've done this, uh, you'd be able to reinvest in bringing uh, X number of houses up to standard. That's a factor that has to be done as well. So budget considerations of local authorities and other key partners are, are very, very serious matters. Uh, but look, we're supportive of getting uh, pride in local areas. Uh, and we're working with Newport City Homes in central Newport, for example, and how they can change the local environment of some of the, the flats and properties in the pill area so they're more open and tidied up, better litter bins, for example, so that there isn't litter everywhere, so people feel more content, therefore safer, in their local communities. So all these things are important. 
I think obviously uh, we're obviously making Newport a bit more sexy. You know that has you know gone some way, but I think there's also the issue of that we are seeing homelessness more than any mm. other time mm. now. Um, we are obviously seeing people openly dealing and taking drugs, um, even if it is just cannabis. Um, and I think there is still kind of an unsafe feel to Newport that there is, uh, you know, people don't entirely feel too safe. Um, some people have even described it as um, when they're being asked for money by homeless, that they're being accosted, um, mm. which might be a little bit exaggeration of what's actually happening. But, you know, even, even just seeing that is quite, uh, I suppose, depressing to them, perhaps. It, it, look, it, look, look, it is. And this is, um, I, I'm not in any way trying to undermine it or pour cold water on this but it's a problem for society as a whole um, certainly the police have a role to play in terms of public safety and where anyone homeless or otherwise is genuinely making a nuisance of themselves perhaps being a bit aggressive may not even realize that they're being uh, uh, aggressive then we want to work with key partners to to help them um, we know there are issues of homelessness. We know there's a huge issue in terms of mental health problems as well. Um, and we really want to play our role. And, you know, police training now is very much about person-centred, trying to understand where a person is coming from. And if we can resolve the matter and not take people into custody, we, we would far rather do that. But we are not going to resolve the ills of society by ourselves um, we talked earlier about the austerity program and the impact that's had uh, on a lot of public services. And homelessness, I'm afraid to say, is is part of that. It's also to do with the economy. People either losing jobs or going onto jobs with very low pay, haven't got enough money. We're working when we know the rise in food banks, for example. It's often said they're the only banks that are increasing uh, in Britain at the moment. And it's very true, and the Trussell Trust will tell you uh, that they're anticipating greater rises in the demand for food banks and that's all a symptom of uh, these deep social problems but we'll play our part we'll play our part uh, and we'll work closely with homeless charities for example uh, and they do excellent work but their resources are limited mm. my last few questions are from uh, our listeners what's your view on the current one percent pay freeze do you think it should be lifted Yes, uh, the 1% Yes, I do. Uh, I, I think that it's gone on now since 2.10. It applies to police as well as anybody else uh, in the public sector. But uh, there's no doubt um, that it's um, causing uh, dissatisfaction. doesn't mean that people are not taking pride in their jobs and are not giving it 100%. But I don't think we're rewarding our public service uh, personnel adequately. And I'm talking about all of them here, not just the emergency services. And I think there does need to be a rethink. And I am pleased that that includes now uh, in, uh, major players in terms of leading members of the Conservative Party who are in government who are saying maybe it's time to give uh, a little bit more attention to those independent boards that recommend what pay level should be at, rather than hamstringing them by saying it's 1% no matter what you recommend. Uh, so I think there does need to be a rethink. Uh, and uh, people would benefit benefit from that. Okay. Um, one of our listeners has said, why do I see more police officers in Newport doing their shopping in Tesco rather than walking on the streets? Uh, I suppose you better stress that other superstores are available. But look, <laughs> it's a serious <laughs> question, I'm sure. Now, I, I don't know quite where your viewer or your listener is seeing that. Police officers are entitled to take their breaks. They'll be scheduled. They're quite entitled to go into a store to buy their lunch, if that's what they want to do. Obviously, the Chief Constable and I would be very concerned if they were spending more time than was reasonable in the shops, where, wherever it is. Uh, but, you know, um, I, I've no hard evidence that that is a common problem. As I said, like any employee, they're entitled to breaks or have a cup of coffee from time to time. And if they're out and about, they don't want to spend the time driving all the way back to the police station. If there's a cafe or, or a superstore available for a cup of tea or they're, they're a hot meal, uh, then I see nothing wrong with that, provided, you know, it's it's no more than any of us would e expect for, for a lunch break. Uh, one of my questions is, because I, I know in America they have um, good, uh, quite, an, I know a few people who actually are in the police force in America, um, they have uh, this thing where they have to have a certain amount of interactions with citizens um, every single day. 
Um, is it the same in Britain? I mean, do we have anything where like police officers have to have to have a certain amount of uh, interaction for citizens, or is there anything like that? Yeah, we, well, we certainly, in terms of our neighbourhood teams, expect them to engage with citizens and traders, people in their community. Specifically, it is the role of the police uh, uh, community support officers, PCSOs. They are not meant to be in police stations filling out reports unless there's something exceptional has happened. They meant to be spending all their time as the uniform presence on the street. Uh, we're fortunate in Wales that whilst the numbers, uh, we've certainly had a cut in our funding from the Home Office in terms of PCSOs, but the Welsh Government has stepped in voluntarily because they're not respons- it's not a devolved responsibility policing. They've voluntarily stepped in to provide, in the case of Gwent, funding for 101 PCSOs. So we're able to maintain our numbers in Wales, uh, whereas they're not in England. Uh, and that's due to the collaboration we have with the Welsh Government. So, uh, yes, uh, we certainly want our neighbourhood teams to engage with citizens. PCSOs generally are on foot, so they're ideally placed to do it in town and community centres. Uh, and they will visit, for example, old people's homes, residential homes, hold uh, surgeries there. Uh, and certainly I would expect that of, of constables as, as far as they can. We need to bear in mind, whilst I want to increase officers on neighbourhood policing, and it'll be a focus uh, of, of it, that the nature of crime is changing uh, and there is relatively little crime on the streets. So that's more about reassurance for people, which is important. But I also have to balance that with cybercrime, with drug trafficking, people trafficking now, the curse of people trafficking, it happens here. We've had some very high-profile modern slavery cases here. It's an awful crime, uh, and we have to focus on those issues as well. So it's balance. It's very much the cornerstone of my, my job. Um, another listener says, cars parking on pavements and grassed verges is a real issue for residents and pedestrians. Please can tickets be issued ASAP before there's an accident? Do you see this often in Newport? Yeah, it's, it's a very common complaint, not only in Newport, but all parts of Gwent, and I know in South Wales as well. Uh, when I was an Assembly member, uh, it, it was one of the most uh, regular problems that constituents have in terms of illegal and inconsiderate parking. People parking directly alongside drop curbs, for example. It's just not acceptable, and it's down to people's lack of thought and consideration very often. Uh, we do issue uh, tickets. Uh, PCSOs are authorised to issue tickets and they do especially if the parking that's reported to them is clearly dangerous they'll be issued with tickets I don't want to mislead people because we do not have enough personnel to do it to the extent that we would like to we have to prioritise the use of people however however, uh, next year these matters will be handed over to local authorities right across Gwent, as they already are in the rest of Wales, and therefore the local authority will be the one-stop shop. They will then decide where to place the parking restrictions and then to enforce it. The advantage for the local authority is that any fund, any monies raised through fines, they're able to keep and invest in other services, and obviously to pay for the wardens or whatever they, they choose to call them. When it's in the police's hands, we can collect fines, but we're not allowed to keep it. It has to go back to central government. Right. Um, what, one question I do have is, do you think maybe we could solve that issue by lowering the price of um, car parking tolls, perhaps? Oh, uh, right. <laughs> well, yeah, perhaps, perhaps. Um, different local authorities have different policies. In some local authorities, all parking is uh, within Gwent mm. is free. In others, it is low. That's really the call of the local authority. It, 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 it is a funding stream, yeah. And as I said, you know, they're strapped for cash. They have to look at reasonable means of raising it. One advantage, hopefully, is that people might be tempted to leave their cars at home and use more public transport. Mm. Now, I'm hopeful that when the metro system, the South East Wales metro, is up and running in a few years' time, that that will be the outcome. And we won't see the congestion, the carbon footprint will will be improved, and there'll be less pressure on on car parks. Uh, but that's a few years down, down the line. Um, 
you know, it, it's really for the local authority to judge in terms of the, the, the car parking. Hmm. To finish off on, Jeff, um, if people want to get in contact with you and um, ask you their own questions, how can they do that? Okay, well, look, I get a lot of contact, mainly through email. Um, and I've given you my card. You've got my email address on there, which I'm quite happy for you to give out, yep. and the uh, the office's uh, phone number okay, okay. on there uh, as well. Um, don't use the mobile phone because that's one that hardly ever I- is used. Uh, it's best to ring the office, um, uh, and they'll if I'm not there, they'll they'll record the message and they'll pass it on to me. However, I believe very much in face to face contact, and I do hold police surgeries across the different parts of Gwent. Uh, very often that will be in collaboration with the local assembly members or the MPs because uh, sometimes policing issues will be raised. Uh, and indeed, I, I attend meetings of uh, town and uh, community councils. I've spoken to the full uh, Newport uh, City Council uh, and I'm very happy to meet groups of residents, very often through their local councillor. Uh, and if people have issues they want to put to me in a, in a structured way, uh, I suggest they get in touch with the office. That sounds good. Thanks for coming on, Jeff. No problem. Been a pleasure.